Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. I like that, they answered back. And, and thank you for your patience. Uh, this hearing is now being called to order. This is a public hearing on the City Council's Committee of Public Safety. The purpose of this hearing is to hear testimony on bill number 180699 and resolution number 171091. Uh, Ms. Williams, could you read the titles of the bills? Bill number 180699, an ordinance amending title 10 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Regulation of Individual Conduct and Activity by Amending Section 10615 entitled Disorderly Conduct and Related Offenses and Chapter 102100 entitled Marijuana Possession to provide for certain additional offenses to be enforceable by civil penalties under certain terms and conditions and resolution number 171091 a resolution authorizing the City Council Committee on Public Safety to hold hearings examining compliance with the ban the box law since its enactment and further examine the willingness of local area universities to ban the box from college applications. Thank you, Ms. Williams, and I recognize the presence of a quorum of this committee, um, uh, Councilman Tallenberger, Councilman Greenlee, and Councilman Johnson, and myself, Curtis Jones, Jr. Um, would you please bring forth the first group to testify? Inspector Francis Healy. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Inspector, for being always ready and prepared to represent the city administrations. And say your name for the record, and please, please um, begin your testimony. My name is Francis Healy. I'm Special Advisor to Police Commissioner Ross. Uh, on behalf of the Police Department, thank you for giving the department the opportunity to voice its opinion on this bill. I will defer to Julie uh, Wertheimer's written testimony, uh, but I'm happy to an answer um, uh, my, inf uh, my input basically on, the, on bill number 180699 as it relates to disorderly conduct offenses and the marijuana possession. So and I, was re I was remiss to say, um, would anybody uh, from the committee like to have opening remarks? I just but had a question. Question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilman Greenlee. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one question, Inspector. Uh, I know this um, puts uh, purchasing or attempting to purchase a small amount of marijuana as a civil uh, Correct. Uh, issue, right? It does not affect those who sell to the pur purchaser, correct? That is correct. And is there any reason to be concerned legally about that, splitting that? Well, too? oftentimes the purchasers, quite frankly, are individuals that are addicted or, or using drugs as opposed to the sellers. So there is a distinction under state law for that offense as well. Hi. Um, so what we're trying to do is basically um, put in parity what we have already in place. Um, right now, the, um, I believe the district attorney's office is declining to prosecute a great number of these or purchasing only cases. Okay. So this allows the officers the opportunity to still intervene, or, uh, especially when the community is calling them for help. So it's not like we can't do anything. The, the, we report to the community, that's who we serve. So this allows us to take police action so the community can feel free to call us. We can still take police action, irrespective on the back end whether somebody's going to be facing criminal charges. But this does distinguish from sellers. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a possession with intent to deliver is a much different charge than merely purchasing. Okay, I just want to make sure there wasn't in, in, Yeah, and in, I will say the purchasing was actually when we first did this last time. Uh, the purchasing was maybe it been an oversight, and I'll say maybe on my part. Um, so we were um, small amounts of possession of marijuana. We were still processing with CVNs, but people that were purchasing were getting arrested. So there was a little bit of a, a difference. So this really solidifies it and makes everything consistent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Councilman. Uh, one other clarification for the record. In, a lot of people are under the misnomer that it is now legal. Uh, it is decriminalized. There's a big difference. Um, <laughs> there is a big confusion about that. The issue is it is still illegal under state law. Uh, we have not changed that. The city of Philadelphia cannot change that. However, how we enforce it in Philadelphia has been directed by the mayor's executive order. So. Um, Several years ago, City Council allowed these things to be identified as uh, code violation notices. That's why we included them into the code. And by executive order of the mayor, the police department is directed to follow through with the CVN versus the state charge. So that's been very, very successful and helpful, and especially a lot in our protests and demonstrations and those type of events. A lot of people that need to be um, restrained or controlled temporarily has allowed us to do what we need to do without having long-term criminal ramifications. And one other clarifying point is that if you are under the influence of marijuana 
and commit some other offense that then is also considered. For example, um, if someone operates a piece of equipment, whether it's a vehicle or a heavy piece of equipment under the influence, that goes into consideration in the charges as well. Absolutely, that's, this is well beyond that scope. That's under the vehicle code. That's a, those are misdemeanor violations, yes. You'd be arrested just as you would driving under the influence of alcohol for, for alcohol. I, I just wanted to make a clarification. I was uh, walking Captain Jack Jones, which is my dog, uh, and we were in front of a, a middle school, and there were some young people coming out, uh, rolling uh, and getting ready for their deck. I guess they thought it was the breakfast of champions. And I explained to them that they shouldn't be doing that. And they said, well, wait a minute, it's legal. I said, no, it's decriminalized. And I had to go into that lecture, not that they cared, right. uh, but I had to make the clarification anyway. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Are there any other questions? And I recognize the presence of Councilwoman Janie Blackwell. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Here, now we'll hear from Ms. Wertheimer. Uh, and thank you for attending. Um, please apologies. begin. That's all right. Please, we, we're so rarely on time <laughs> that that threw you off. You figured you had a grace period. Such is not the case. Would you state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Sure. Julie Wertheimer, uh, Senior Director of Criminal Justice for the city. Um, Good afternoon, Chairman Jones and members of the Public Safety Committee. My name is Julie Wertheimer. Um, the Managing Director's Office supports Bill Number 108699, which amends Chapter 10-600 of the City Code to include a new Section 10615 entitled Disorderly Conduct and Related Offenses and Chapter 10-2100 entitled Marijuana Possession to provide for certain additional offenses to be enforceable by civil pen penalties all under certain terms and conditions. The intent of this bill is to decriminalize certain additional low-level pu public conduct offenses in public places. It will effectively prevent new incidents from entering the criminal justice system by permitting the Philadelphia Police Department to address disorderly public behavior and the purchasing of marijuana for per personal use through the civil system. Um, can I actually abbreviate my testimony yeah, and submit um, it in feel writing? Free. I just want to add. Any objection? No. no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I I just want to add one um, part of this that's a, a little more um, editorial on the city's part, which is the original CBN bill from 2016 um, was one of actually was the first of the initiatives we rolled out under the MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge, which, as you know, Councilman is the entire uh, systems commitment, the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, our DA and defenders efforts to collectively work with community to safely reduce our jail population and um, divert people who don't need to be part of the criminal justice system out of the system um, altogether. And so this expansion um, with three additional um, potential eligible offenses um, will only further those efforts. We agree, um, at least I do, uh, and I'm sure members of the committee will make their uh, positions clear in a vote. Uh, but what uh, was started by you and, and the respective committees is an important part of um, reducing uh, the population in the census and the, the contact uh, with the criminal justice system. Um, one of the things the best form of reentry is never entering at all mm -hmm. um, to keep people out of the system. Um, and we'll, I deferred my opening comments so that I could maintain my quorum, but I will when we do the resolution on um, ban the box for college students. So uh, are there any other questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, we are going to temporarily uh, move out of our public hearing and go into our public meeting with the intent of moving this bill out of committee uh, with a, a favorable recommendation. The chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that bill number 180699 be reported as committee with favorable recommendation and a rule suspension to allow for, next, uh, for first reading our next session of council. Second. It has been moved and properly sent 
seconded that this bill be moved out of committee with a favorable recommendation that further the rules of council be suspended to allow first reading of this bill at our next session of council. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the ayes have it. And bill number 180699 has been moved out of committee. Uh, we will now go back into our public hearing. Uh, and would you please, Ms. Williams, read the title of the resolution? Did, did you? She did. Okay. All right, could you read it again so that we know what we're talking no about? No problem. Resolution number 171091, a resolution authorizing the City Council Committee on Public Safety to hold hearings examining compliance with the Ban the Box Law since its enactment and further examining the willingness of local area universities to ban the box from college applications. Thank you, Ms. Williams, for repeating yourself. Um, Chair also recognizes that Councilman Green is in attendance. Um, I'm going to start with this. I was in another life a track coach, and I dealt with a lot of young people uh, on their way to somebody's college campus. One of those uh, young individuals that I came in contact with uh, was from a low-income community and did not have a trust fund, did not have a secure way to get to college, and once he got to college, wasn't sure of how he was going to pay for his room and board and a meal plan. So he decided uh, to be entrepreneurial. And what he decided to do as his uh, retail opportunity was to sell DVDs and CDs. Those DVDs and CDs were uh, not patented, they were bootleg. Uh, and in his mind, he thought that was a victimless crime, something that could get him through um, but, you know, and be able to pay for his necessities uh, on his way to college. The uh, patent people that represent movies came down very hard on this maybe, I'm going to say 20 years ago, uh, real hard and really started taking people to task for selling those movies and CDs. Today, nobody watches CDs or DVDs, or at least nobody of a certain age. <laughs> Still does it. This young man got a record and was unable to get into college once that little box was checked. It altered his whole career path. He is now a volunteer, still. His daughter um, is a track uh, star and works with her, but he was not able to pursue his college career as an athlete because of this mishap. People make mistakes. Um, the only perfect thing is, depending on your system of belief, is God. Everybody else we should forgive or to keep out of these type of situations where that scarlet letter follows them around forever. This is a furtherance of that kind of pushing of people to the right path and keeping them from a path of limitations and marginalizations. So with that, would you please um, ask, well, are there any other comments from people on this committee? Seeing none, would you bring up the first a group of witnesses to testify? Rue Landau. You can bring up more than one. Uh, Jamie Gullen and Tracy Johnson can come up as well. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you. Welcome uh, to City Council. And you're not new, so state your name and begin your testimony. Absolutely. Good afternoon, Chairperson Jones and members of the Public Safety Committee. <clears throat> I'm Rue Landau, Executive Director of the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Resolution 171091, examining compliance with Ban the Box since its enactment and the willingness of local area universities to ban the box on college applications. <clears throat> the PCHR is a city agency that administers and enforces the Fair Practices Ordinance, the law that prohibits discrimination in housing, employment, public accommodations, and um, 
public accommodations with, and the delivery of city services. Our agency also enforces the Fair Criminal Records Screening Standards Act, known as Fair Chance Hiring Law, and also known as Ban the Box. And it's found in Chapter 9-3500 of the Philadelphia Code. I want to pause for a second and just recognize uh, my Deputy Director, Pamela Gwaltney, and Principal Assistant Attorney Karen Foreman, who are the people who are on the ground day to day uh, helping to enforce this law. So the purpose of the Fair Chance Hiring Laws to, was to eliminate unfair, behavior, uh, unfair barriers to employment for people with criminal records, enabling them to acquire the employment needed <clears throat> to become reestablished with their communities and contributing members of society. The law, as passed in 2011, prohibited questions about criminal history on job applications and during the first interview. It also prohibited questions regarding records of arrest that did not lead to conviction. By 2015, it became clear that to be truly effective, the city's uh, fair chance hiring law needed to be more than remove the box from the application. The law was amended that year to prohibit an employer from running a criminal background check until after the applicant received a conditional offer of employment. If through a background check, an employer discovers that an applicant has a criminal history, the applicant must be provided an individualized assessment for a particular job instead of being summarily rejected for employment. <clears throat> The employer may reject an applicant based on their criminal record after the assessment only if the employer can reasonably conclude that the applicant would pre present an unacceptable risk to the operation of the business or to coworkers or customers. A rejection must be pre presented to the applicant in writing with an opportunity for the applicant to re respond to the determination. These standards are consistent with existing state law and federal EEOC guidance. <clears throat> In 2018, the Fair Chance Hiring Law was amended again to explicitly prohibit consideration of juvenile records during the hiring process. I want to thank you, Councilman Jones, for spearheading all of these great protections and also uh, Councilwoman Gim for adding the juvenile protections as well. The system for hiring removes significant barriers to employment <clears throat> and provides true assistance to people with records as they re reintegrate into their communities. <clears throat> It also provides greater clarity and guidance to employers. Since our law was passed in 2011, the Commission has helped to ensure effective implementation of the ordinance through education as well as enforcement. Through outreach efforts, partnerships, and trainings, we've reached hundreds of employers and thousands of people with criminal records. This summer, the Commission ran a media campaign to raise awareness and provide information about the law to the general public and targeted audiences impacted by criminal records. Informational ads in English and Spanish promoting the law were placed on bus shelters, websites, classified ads, and social media. Radio ads uh, ran on English and Spanish language stations. Bilingual posters and distribution materials were provided to area prisons, libraries, and governmental district offices. Additionally, <clears throat> outreach teams canvassed high traffic spots uh, and, and, and gave materials out at, to places such as barber shops, and coffee shops in targeted neighborhoods. Since the Fair Chance hiring law went into effect, the commission has investigated 154 complaints related to noncompliance. Wow. 86 of those cases were filed since the amendments went into effect in 2016. The large majority of the cases of the cases settled during the investigation process, oftentimes with benefits awarded to the complainants. Only one case has proceeded to an adjudicated, uh, adjudicatory hearing, and it resulted in a $30,000 judgment for the complainant and training for the respondent by the PCHR. Incidentally, that uh, case was for a coach um, for young people at a charter school who rejected somebody who only had an arrest uh, many years ago on his record. Other examples of cases demonstrate the benefits of, individual, of the individualized assessment required in Section 9-3504. For example, an individual was offered a position delivering merchandise to retail stores. A background check revealed a drug-related conviction and the offer was withdrawn. Had the employer conducted an individualized assessment, they would have found that over seven years had passed since the conviction, the person had no prior convictions, was never incarcerated, and completed parole. 
Significantly, the individual held a successful position in a similar job until a layoff and was able to provide good employment and personal references. That case was settled through mediation and the individual was offered a full-time job. Another individual was offered a position as a telephone, at a telephone call center representative. The offer was rescinded when a background check revealed a prior drug conviction. The nature of the conviction had no relationship to the duties of the position for which the individual was well qualified, having job experience, demonstrating call center skills, and excellent references. The complaint was also settled quickly with an offer of employment. Higher education is an important means to enable returning citizens or any individual with a criminal record to acquire additional skills and more fully contribute to their community. Community Legal Services, who you'll hear from in a second, recently released a report encouraging colleges and universities in Philadelphia to end the practice of unnecessarily asking applicants to disclose information uh, about juvenile and criminal records on their application. This practice has a disparate impact on youth of color who are overcriminalized at alarming rates. In addition, research has shown that merely asking for the information on the application can prevent people with records from completing applications and enrolling in school. Local area universities should be encouraged to remove questions of prior criminal arrest and conviction from their application forms and to make non-mandatory the indicator field in any common application submission disclosing a prior record. <clears throat> They also should suggest on their application that primary consideration will be given to the individual's qualifications. If subsequent criminal record information is identified or disclosed, consideration should be given to the relevancy of the conviction to academic pursuits, the time passed since the incident, evidence of good character and remediation, and any associated risks. The PCHR, in collaboration with Councilman Jones's office, is preparing to disseminate a letter to the higher educational institutions, all the presidents across the region, in support of this position. Much progress has been made since the passage and expansion of the city's fair chance hiring law. Educational and outreach efforts have raised awareness of the rights of individuals with criminal records <clears throat> as applicable to employment opportunities. It is hard to assess the long-range impact of fair chance laws toward removing the fears and stigmas associated with a criminal record, a fear that often deters a job or educational candidate from initiating an application in the first place. Yet the outlook for broader opportunities and better lives is anticipated to continue to improve. Building upon the positive outcomes of Philadelphia's fair chance hiring law, the PCHR supports encouraging local area colleges and universities to en enact similar fair chance policies for those seeking higher educational opportunities. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, um, <coughs> y'all don't know how beautiful you look to me sitting this way. Um, to see this much... Um, a lot of times we pass laws all the time and there aren't people advocating uh, for change. And so I don't want your arms to get tired, but you can stand up here like that <laughs> the whole hearing as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I want to thank you and your commission because yes, we embarked upon the ban the box uh, law along with my colleagues a while ago. But if there is no enforcement on you mentioned how many cases you looked It's 154 at? total since 2011, <clears throat> um, 83 of which recently. But that's not all of the cases that, um, those are the cases that we're investigating. We also, also give out a lot of advice to employers and lawyers who are representing employers every day and a lot of advice to, to uh, people who are applying um, for jobs too, but those are the cases that we've docketed. So as Councilman Green can speak to, a lot of laws are in the books, a lot of commissions are here. If, if, if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears, is there, is there a sound? And without you following up on this, um, people could and companies could ignore it and act as though it never was passed. So I want to thank you publicly um, for your, your diligence. and. I know as a human relations commissioner at the state that you are a rock star. And, uh, <laughs> folk, we are lucky in this city uh, to have you advocating uh, for these laws. So tell me, how has the receptiveness of universities thus far uh, been? And I know some of them are in the audience. I'm not going to point you out. I know you're there. Right. 
I see. But are you hearing any feedback? So we're, I'm going to pass that to CLS. We are, your office and you and I are in the process of drafting a letter that we're going to send to all of them, but I haven't done the outreach of, to them yet. CLS has, and I'll, I'll pass that over to them. But I also want to just say thank you to you and also thank you to my team. You know, we are extremely committed to giving people with criminal records in Philadelphia a second chance, and I speak on behalf of my commissioners as well. It is one of the most important things that we do, so thank you for giving us the opportunity opportunity as well. And before you go, um, Councilwoman Yim, would you uh, like to? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, just wanted to say and express my thanks um, and apologies for being a little bit late, but expressing my support for Bill number 180699 as well. But, um, you know, I also want to thank the audience for being out here and raising attention to this critical issue. Um, college is supposed to be about opportunity. It's supposed to be about possibilities for young people. It's not about closing off avenues um, because of things that were uh, done in the past that were also uh, redeemed, you know, where there's been redemption for that. Um, and I especially want to thank yourself, uh, Commissioner Landau, for like all the incredible work you and your team did, along with our great partners in the community and all the advocates who are here today, in part because you're helping us change the understanding. We're not going to be able to um, help our private colleges and universities and even our state colleges and universities understand the consequences of their action unless we make a little bit of noise to do so. Um, and it's got to come from people who have suffered some of the consequences of it. So thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your courage in speaking out. Thank you, Commissioner, for being so great about all of that. Um, and then just for clarity, you know, I just wanted to get that number right. Yeah. How, could you just repeat it loud and clear for the record? How many cases yep. have you had to deal with with um, the box again? So these are 154 complaints um, since the law was originally passed in 2011 and 86 of those since the amendments um, in 2016. And the amendments mean everything to us. It was very difficult uh, before we had this process of getting someone, someone has to get a conditional offer of employment first before their uh, criminal record was run. It was very hard for us to figure out before the amendments why someone didn't get the job. Could have been for a host of reasons and the employer always had an excuse. Now someone gets a conditional offer of employment and that, and that offer is rescinded and that gives us a moment. And they tell them why it's rescinded and that when we get to have that conversation, what was the nature of the crime, when did it occur, and what is the connection to the job that you're looking for, as well as all of the evidence of rehabilitation that we're looking for that might include college and higher education. Yes, and thank you as well for sending that letter of information and just a reminder about the importance that we can't discriminate against people. Um, but uh, just out of curiosity again, what is the number of investigators in, in the commission that works on all of these cases? I mean, as a whole commission? Eight. Eight, yeah. okay. And, and your budget? These are, that's not our discrimination cases mm -hmm. as well. Those are only the ban the box cases. Those are only, you have eight investigators on only ban the box? No, no. eight investigators who handle all of our discrimination Correct. cases, employment, housing, places of public accommodation, and ban the box. That's right. Okay. A fair chance hiring now. We're yes. And, you know, again, I think you do uh, heroic work for the number of investigators that you have, but I think it's clearly um, uh, a clear responsibility in our cities on our city end that we need to, as we work on strengthening the civil rights and protections for our residents and for our young people, that we're clearly going to have to expand enforcement. I don't think it's so much on the end of, it, of letting employers know. Many of them uh, are amongst our largest employers and certainly colleges and universities have whole uh, legal departments behind them. I think it's really our people who need to know um, who are applying to colleges and universities, as well as advocates and our other members, um, that that they have that, that city council has created a number of uh, labor protections, and we need to be able to um, hold many people and institutions accountable for them. So I'm personally uh, grateful for all the work that you've done. I think that there needs to be an important conversation about how to expand um, enforcement within our city and education for a lot of our workers and communities. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, Chairman Jones. You made a statement earlier about uh, Ms. Landau and her staff being a rock star. Uh, oh since she went to Temple University, I would say she was a diamond. <laughs> especially considering I stand corrected, we're, especially considering we're in the same. For the record, let the record reflect. She is a 
diamond, not a rock star. <laughs> Pastor, considering we were in the same class, I won't say how long ago that was, but we just had a, just had a reunion on self. Friday. Yes. But I'm curious in reference to, I know the work of the Commission on Relations more an investigatory body, um, but in, in doing the investigations you're doing and also the, the work you've done in reference to Ban the Box, I'm um, curious, have you any thoughts in reference to how it's impacted poverty in the city, um, how it has um, enabled more people to be hired uh, who may not have been hired? Um, one of the concerns I've had historically with these type of measures is that it's, you know, under our federal constitution, you're not supposed to be penalized twice for one crime. And um, once someone has um, done their time and have served their time in reference to the Commonwealth and federal government, um, they should not have to continue to um, live with that, that, that sin going forward. And the ban of box has always been one of those type of things that has that stigma mm -hmm. um, uh, when you have those type of uh, initiatives. And so having the ban of box legislation that came about through Councilman Donna Ree Miller, um, I think helps to address that. So I'm curious from your perspective how it's impacted um, things in the city from a poverty perspective, especially in reference to hiring. So I can only speak in terms of the cases that we right. have that come to our office, but they are extremely successful and have been since the first rendition of the law. It was very easy when employers didn't know about the law we would just tell them, we gave them, uh, basically send them a letter and give them a warning, take this question off your application, and they just did it 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, they changed software in their computers. They would go to their national um, offices, the corporate offices, to start getting that change made. They would make it sometimes just for Philadelphia, and then you had the large corporations like Target who took it off um, for the entire country. But um, we don't always know the details in the private settlements of our cases, when we, um, sometimes we're a party to them, sometimes when we mediate them, and especially if we found probable cause in a case, we certainly absolutely know the terms of the settlements. But oftentimes, most of the times when the cases are settling, they're settling on favorable terms, which would either include um, money and benefits to people, uh, or they actually got the job, which is oftentimes what people wanted. Um, again, sometimes these are employers who don't know about the law. Uh, sometimes they did know about the law and we're trying to skirt them and each case is different, but this is in highly, highly successful. And again, the, the, the barriers that we've put in, not barriers, the uh, steps that we've put in place now, where you have to give the conditional offer of employment first, has made it so clear. It's a much easier law to enforce than, um, you know, our discrimination cases come in um, oftentimes with someone tells us their allegations, the employer tells a different side of the story, you have to do a large investigation, witnesses, documents, it takes a long time to try to put pieces of a puzzle together to figure out what really happened here. Ban the box, fair chance hiring is so much more clear for us now. Mm -hmm. And it's so clear and so easy that it makes it so, um, that it's, it's very successful. So to the extent that getting people jobs and or giving them a large amount of money and allowing them to go on armed with knowledge that they need for the next job to get another job, to the extent that that's helpful to alleviate poverty, I'd say we're doing pretty well. Okay, I want to quick follow up. Um, in and this may come from your conversation with colleagues in other cities that may have similar um, legislation. Um, have you seen any similar dynamics what's happened in those jurisdictions that also happen here in Philadelphia? Um, <clears throat> Philadelphia's got one of the best laws. Uh, we always, we talk to our, nas nationally we talk to our colleagues about that all the time. Baltimore, in fact, just basically took all of our, took our law, took our information and copied everything and just put their logos on it. And we were happy to share that with them once we found out they took it from us. Um, but we are very happy to have them do that as well. Um, we are, uh, I can, you know, might need a little cheat sheet behind me, but basically what I do know is that we have one of the strongest laws um, and that other people are trying to strengthen their laws to follow us. But it's, it's a pretty successful venture. This is not, it used to be taboo to talk about this. It is not taboo anymore. Mm -hmm. 
And when we first, when the law was first passed in 2011, employers didn't want to admit that they were hiring people with records. And I feel like that stigma is going away very fast. In fact, people get to proudly promote they're doing this because they know it's the right thing in Philadelphia, especially with so many people with criminal records. Yeah, I was going to ask about best practices from other cities, but it seems like we're providing the best practices here. So I will end my questions with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to let you go okay. because I understand you have obligations at home. Yes. So we thank you for taking your time and doing that. I just want everyone to know for the record, um, in the second rendition of Band the Box, there was some dicey language that quite frankly, uh, my political courage meter and between you CLS and uh, Prison Society. They would not let me out my office. <laughs> I mean, literally, not let me out until we straighten that out. And I'm forever grateful uh, for, for that. Uh, and so take care of your kids. Thank you so much. Um, I believe my deputy director, Pam Gwaltney, and Karen Foreman will be here throughout if you need them. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, sorry for, we usually let the whole panel go. Uh, first, but she has some obligations at home. So bring the mic to you, um, state your name for the record, and please begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Gullen. I'm a supervising attorney in the Employment Unit at Community Legal Services, and I also co-lead CLS's Youth Justice Project. Um, the Employment Unit at Community Legal Services has been at the forefront of advocating for the rights of people with criminal records for decades. Every year we represent over 1,000 low-income Philadelphians who are struggling to access employment opportunities because of a record. Um, and many of our clients are desperate to find any job, entry-level minimum wage, but we know at the end of the day that entry-level minimum wage jobs are not enough. Our clients and people all over Philadelphia need and deserve access to the education and training that will allow them to have careers that pay living wages so that they can support themselves and their families with dignity. That is why CLS is here today with all of our partners calling on Philadelphia area colleges and universities to end educational discrimination against people with records by banning the box on their applications, ending the practice of asking about prior criminal histories. We're asking Philadelphia City Council to help us in encouraging colleges and universities to ban the box. The common application, which is a centralized process through which applicants can apply to many schools at once, just recently announced that it is ending its practice of asking about criminal histories on the common application. This was a huge victory that only came about because of the tireless efforts of advocates around the country, many of whom are here today. Uh, but now, the ball is really in the court of the local area colleges and universities who each one by one will make a decision about whether they're going to continue this practice of asking about prior records. So it's even more important that we're here today asking our local area colleges and universities to step up and end this practice. This practice is, so pro is problematic in multiple ways. First, it's very unclear how information di disclosed on college applications is actually being used. A study conducted among New York colleges found that fewer than half of the schools that collected criminal record information had any sort of policies in place about how that information would be reviewed. And 60% of colleges provided zero training to admissions officers about how to review and evaluate criminal records information. Three quarters of colleges that collected the information used it in making decisions about admissions, and one quarter had absolute automatic bars that prevented people with certain types of records from being admitted. Because the admissions process is a bit of a black box, it's impossible to know exactly how our Philadelphia area schools are evaluating this information. But we call upon Philadelphia area colleges and universities to release what if, whatever information they do have regarding their policies, training protocols, and admissions outcomes for individuals who disclose a prior criminal record on an application. In addition to the outright denials, just asking about whether somebody has a record on a college application has a deterrent effect on students completing that application in the first place. A study among the State University of New York system or SUNY system found that when somebody checked the box saying they had a prior felony conviction, 62% of people who checked that box did not actually end up completing the application. 
This is called felony application attrition. And it particularly impacts applicants of color who because of racial bias in our system are more likely to have a record. Because of the discriminatory and detrimental impact that was found from the SUNY system asking this question, SUNY removed its questions from its application starting in 2018. In a city like Philadelphia that has the highest poverty rate of any big city in the country, this issue is even more critical than it was in New York. It's estimated that 500,000 Philadelphians have some kind of prior record. Philadelphia also has one of the highest rates of mass incarceration of any big city in the country. A recent study found that had mass incarceration not occurred between, nine, from between 1980 and 2004, the poverty rate would be 20% lower today. So if Philadelphia is serious about reducing its poverty rate, ameliorating the impact of mass incarceration on its residents must be a top priority. Because of the higher wages associated with higher education, ending educational discrimination for people with records is critical to this effort. Moreover, education is one of the most effective ways to prevent individuals from returning to prison. Individuals who engaged in some kind of educational programming or training were 43% less likely to return to prison and had employment rates up to 28% higher upon release. So if Philadelphia is serious about ending mass incarceration, ending educational discrimination, and increasing access to education both inside and outside of prison is critical. Colleges and universities have justi justified their discriminatory practices by claiming that criminal record screening is important for campus safety. While screening for prior records may seem like an easy way to accomplish this noble goal, it is unfortunately ineffective. One study found that 96% of college seniors who had engaged in some kind of misconduct on campus had no prior criminal record. Another study showed that crimes on campus are often committed by students with no records and are more likely to be, yes. yes. Repeat that again. 96% of college seniors who were found to have engaged in misconduct on campus had no prior criminal record. And another study found that um, people who committed offenses on campus were much more likely to be associated with binge drinking, Greek life, and college athletics, and were not likely to have a prior criminal record. That is why a notable national survivor-led organization called Know Your Nine that empowers students to end sexual violence on campus supports this campaign to ban the box on college campuses. Recent research also shows that individuals with records may actually be more likely to succeed when they're given an opportunity than those without records. A study of individuals with records who enlisted in the military showed that those who had prior records were actually promoted more quickly and to higher ranks and were no more likely to leave for um, poor performance than other enlistees. So we must hold local colleges and universities accountable to be basing their admissions policies and evidence-based practices rather than falling back on tired stereotypes about people with prior records. We must also look to leaders like Community College of Philadelphia, CCP, who are demonstrating that inclusion works. The Vice President for Academic and Student Success at CCP, Dr. Samuel Hirsch, has explained why CCP does not screen for criminal records on its application stating, Community College of Philadelphia strongly supports open access to higher education because it serves as the foundation for strong, prosperous, prosperous communities. Individuals who have paid their debt to society and served their sentence deserve a chance to fully develop the academic abilities that will enable them to contribute in meaningful ways across the city. With more than a quarter of local residents currently living below the poverty line, there is a pressing need to educate even greater numbers of Philadelphians. CCP's reentry support project is a model in not only accepting people with prior records, but supporting them so that they can be successful in achieving their goals. We need more of our local colleges and universities to step up and be leaders alongside CCP so that people have an option when they complete their degree at CCP to go on and obtain a four-year degree. Philadelphia is full of motivated and capable individuals with prior records who will become the future leaders of our city if they're given the chance. Rather than block their potential and miss out on their badly needed contributions, Philadelphia area colleges and universities should adopt best practices and remove questions about juvenile and criminal records from their applications. This simple change will not impact campus safety, but it will open the door to opportunity to countless people who will further their educations and careers while enhancing the diversity and vitality of our campuses, communities, and our city as a whole. 
Thank you to Councilman Jones and to City Council for holding this hearing today and inviting us to speak on this issue of great importance to our city. Thank you so much for your testimony. Would you uh, now proceed? And then we'll ask questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Tracy Johnson, and I am an Equal Justice Works Fellow sponsored by Greenberg Traurig and the Employment Union at Community Legal Services. Thank you, Councilman Jones and the rest of City, of City Council for the opportunity to testify before you today about the urgent need to ban the box on college applications and why doing so is necessary for our city, our young people, communities of color, and more increasingly, for women. As a legal intern at CLS and now as a fellow, I have done extensive research on the criminal record screening policies at a variety of Philadelphia area colleges and universities. I have found that when an applicant answers affirmatively to the criminal records question, the college admissions committee at a given school will often review the record, ask applicants to complete supplemental forms or come in for additional interviewing. As you can imagine, this additional process can cast serious doubts on the applicant's own, own belief about their ability to be admitted into college. And as such, applicants can become fearful of being rejected and decide not to complete their application and basically self-select out. None of the schools surveyed in my research have data on the attrition or denial rates of applicants who answer affirmative, affirmatively to the criminal records question. However, the State University of New York, SUNY, conducted a study looking at the attrition rates for applicants with felonies on their criminal record. The study revealed that each year, 2,924 applicants check the box disclosing a felony conviction. Of those applicants, 1,828 do not complete the application. Colleges and Community Fellowship, a nonprofit dedicated to helping women with criminal convictions earn college degrees, reports that two out of three people that start a college application and select yes to the question regarding criminal history do not finish the application. This evidences a huge barrier to access in higher education for people with criminal records. Asking about criminal records on college applications has a disproportionate impact on young people of color. Due to inequities such as the over-policing of black and brown neighborhoods and the alarming rate at which students of color are funneled into the criminal justice system because of school discipline issues, young people of color are particularly likely to have juvenile or criminal records. Black youth are, are 3.64 times more likely to be arrested and prosecuted in juvenile court in Philadelphia than their white peers. Black youth make up only 13.4% of the youth population, but accounted for 45.5% of juvenile arrest. Black, black young adults age, ages age between 18 to 24 in Pennsylvania account for 31.6% percent of arrests, while older black adults account for 26.8 arrests. Now given the racial bias and inequity that exists throughout the criminal justice system, asking about criminal records on college applications has civil rights implications. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits entities, including schools that receive federal funding, from discriminating on the basis of race, color, or national origin. Asking about criminal records on applications is a practice that disproportionately causes young people of color to opt out of applying to college or suffer rejection due to their criminal records. There is no justification for asking about criminal history on college applications, especially given its exclusionary impact. To be sure, there is no research indicating that screening for criminal records on college applications or turning away applicants with criminal records make colleges any safer. Research does show that opening the doors to higher education for applicants with records makes society safer. College and Community Fellowships reports that 66% of incarcerated non-degree earners nationwide are likely to return to prison within three years of their release. The likelihood drops to 5.6% for bachelor degree recipients mm. and less than 1% for master deg degree recipients. Therefore, asking about criminal records on college applications shuts out scores of young people, women, and people of color with criminal records without any legitimate justification. Through my fellowship work, 
I examine the ways in which criminal justice issues have an intersectional impact on the lives of young women of color. Women are the fastest growing demographic in the prison population, in part due to the failed war on drugs. Black women in particular are now as likely to be incarcerated as white men. Over two thirds of incarcerated women are also mothers and many are the sole wage earners in their families. As such, women are increasingly suffering the consequences of having a criminal record. I have had the privilege of working with smart, ambitious women who are denied access to meaningful and gainful employment because of their record. Being excluded from higher education adds to that employment barrier, barrier keeping women trapped in low-wage jobs. I work with women who aim to become teachers, nurses, and small business owners. I work with women who are, mom, uh, who are mothers and the primary caretakers of their families. Banning the box on college applications will help young women of color I work with attain, attain an education that will afford them access to meaningful, high growth work, which will ultimately help them provide for themselves and their families that depend on them, thus breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty. I testify before you today in a very hopeful spirit. I'm hoping that City Council will help us bring attention to this important issue. I also hope that communities that care about this issue feel the tide changing because it was our collective work that helped put pressure on the common application to drop the question from their application. And I also hope that Philadelphia area colleges and universities will follow suit and drop the question from their respective applications. And my very sincere hope is that applicants who are paying attention to this work feel supported and more confident applying to colleges and pursuing their dreams. Again, thank you, Councilman Jones and City Council for inviting me to speak to today about an issue that's really dear to my heart. Thank you for your testimony. And um, I'm gonna give the mic to Councilman Green first and then Councilwoman Jones. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you both for your testimony, for the work that Community Legal Services is doing in this area. Um, first question, have you had any conversation with any of the local college and universities? I know you mentioned CCP, but I'm curious about some of the other college and universities in response to uh, this inquiry. Yes, so in my research, I have been reaching out to colleges and universities. I have uh, reached out to Penn, to University of Pennsylvania, Temple, and LaSalle, and left messages for Drexel and Philadelphia University. So, so far, uh, no college has any information about denial rates or attrition rates. Um, and they, they just have really different policies about what they're, what they're gonna do moving forward now that the Comlin application has dropped the question. Um, I know University of Pennsylvania does plan to still ask about the question through supplemental forms. And LaSalle and Temple have said that they will not follow through with supplemental forms if asked about, if they get an applic application through the Common App that doesn't ask about the question, but that still doesn't mean that they're not gonna drop it from their own personal application. Mm -hmm. um, so I have spoken with, I would say three, um, Philadelphia area colleges and university, and we'll continue to uh, reach out to others and you know, see what happens once this new cycle of common apps come through. And, you know, the reason I ask the question, because I, as I reflect on the original um, ban the box legislation done in council in 2011, and then the fair chance hiring law in 2015, um, that, especially the latter uh, legislation, could be a model for those institutions that once a applicant is accepted, then do some type of check if you feel you need to do so after the acceptance. Um, because that's not, one, it takes the, the stigma and discriminatory aspect of having that on the application. And two, if you feel there's a need to, or there's a process, you can do that in your um, interview selection process or just application process, you can do a background check after the committee uh, made some initial decision of granting acceptance to the school. Um, because I, I agree with you in your perspective that people may be um, discouraged in applying when they see that type of um, information request on an application and thinking that they will not get accepted anyway, so why even complete the application? And I guess from my experience, having you know, gone through the admission process, but for 
both through undergraduate and also law school. Uh, ultimately, what I think an admissions officer is trying to do is identify someone um, that she or he will be a good fit for the school and someone that's gone through some type of life experience, especially when you think about the college essay process and others. Those who've been able to go through a life experience have come out of that, a different person, and been able to say, this is something I did and I've been able to achieve, and now I'm here trying to um, enhance myself through education are the type of people that you probably would want in your school. And when you have something on your application that basically sends a red flag or a red light to a potential applicant, well, you may not get accepted or you shouldn't come, that's not allowing not only the school to benefit from potential applicants who could be, you know, prominent alumni when they finish, but also is robbing the student population of other people that could be part of the op that population that they also can learn from because college is not just a opportunity for individuals to learn from a professor but also from individuals to learn from each other as well as professors and I think um, using the fair chance hiring law as could be a model for college universities that if you feel you need to do some type of um, investigation that should be done after the um, application process occurred when initial acceptance has been made so thank you Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And again, I just want to acknowledge the tremendous work that um, CLS has done in this area. We're incredibly grateful. Earlier, we were talking a little bit about how uh, Commissioner Landau is a rock star, but I want to emphasize the rock here, like as in like stalwart, sticking with us, not just entering and exiting stage and rocking it, but just staying with us as incredible partners as we try to work through the complicated areas in which um, you know, really discriminatory practices can find their way through maybe not the most overt ways in which these things happen, but through the really insidious ways in which like ban the box um, and criminal justice records can have on, um, and disciplinary records actually can have on um, future opportunities. So a couple of questions are, do you um, have, we've been doing a lot of work obviously together as well on the juvenile justice front. Do you have a sense of how high school disciplinary records can be used against college applicants? Like, is it the same thing as, the, I know the ban the box thing is not like particularly sophisticated here. So uh, can high school disciplinary records be used against applicants in colleges as well? And how? Yes, the common application actually when it came out recently to say we're going to stop asking about criminal histories on the common application, they explicitly stated they were not banning the box, so to speak, for student disciplinary records. The reason they put forth was that there was more consistency about how that information was being disclosed and used, and so they didn't feel the same urgency around uh, dropping that question from its application. So unfortunately, student discipline history is still going to be asked on the common application application, um, whereas the criminal history question will be left up to the individual schools. And at least at all of the applications I believe we've looked at for individual schools that either have their own application in addition to the common app or just have their own application, they ask both about criminal history and about prior disciplinary record. And I would say it's the same kind of black box situation where people don't really know how that information is being used because schools are not keeping data on that, may not have policies on that, may not train their admission staff about how to view that. Um, and especially with you know issues that Tracy referenced with the school to prison pipeline, we know that that is another barrier. So that is something that needs to be continued to be part of this conversation as mm -hmm. well. And I really do want to thank both of you, but especially Ms. Johnson for like articulating out so clearly the racial implications of how this impacts um, especially our young women, um, but of course our, our black men and boys especially. Um, so, and, and I think you touched on this already, but you've just noticed like a, a, a lack of knowledge, if not some level of ignorance on behalf of admission staff at these universities about what the responsibilities are and certainly about the nuances. Could you just speak a little bit more to what your understanding has been about how well admission staff are even, I mean, I'd like to know how well they're trained, but you know, are they even aware or conscious of some of these concerns that you're raising um, as well? So um, basically from the conversations that I've had, would uh, schools, Philadelphia area colleges and university wants that 
um, question, once that question is affirmatively answered, there's, a di there's an additional review process, and so they're just putting an extra set of eyes on this question in particular. Um, from the admissions uh, folks that I've talked to, they said they still consider all of this information along with the student's academic record. Um, from, from one woman, I think it was the woman who works at LaSalle, they said they look at whether it was a ser how serious the record um, may be. And again, it just, given like the um, research that Jamie testified to, which is the training that people have about what they can consider, um, what considerations they make and their understanding of how people come to be involved with the criminal justice system. I will argue that all of, I don't have research on how, how all of that type of necessary skill is applied to reviewing the criminal records question. Mm -hmm. But I do understand, as Councilman Green said, they want to see how students are going to be a good fit. But I don't know a, particularly about what type of training is being done at Philadelphia area school colleges and universities. And you, the, no one's asked you to do a training for them or anything? Like <laughs> no, although I would love to. <laughs> We'd love for you too as well. Um, yeah, so I think that th those are very helpful. Love to keep working with you on that. If you, you know, your recommendations for us are extremely helpful and important. I mean, no, right now we're having a national discussion in our federal courts about affirmative action. You know, as an Asian American, I am firmly in support of affirmative action. I'd also like to point out that anyone being denied a place because of merit is likely denied a place because of legacy um, admissions. And these are just the ways in which. Um, you know, young people who should always see college as a time of opportunity um, often see things being set up in ways in which certain classes of individuals can get access yeah. to a call, an elite college or university through the legacy, um, you know, admissions, if that's even called that, um, while others are completely seeing doors shut down simply because of um, what we know to be pretty discriminatory actions that happen through the disciplinary and cr criminal justice process. So I really want to thank um, CLS, both of you, all of our advocates for raising your voices and, and shining a light on it because it's really going to have to be a major change in how we look at these practices and undo them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Are there any other questions for this group? Uh, Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Ms. Johnson, did you say that you said you visited various colleges and or universities? So I didn't visit, um, so through Penn it was an email exchange about their policies and with Temple and LaSalle it was a phone conversation. And so I have been, and I've, I reached out to Philadelphia University and Drexel University, so I've been trying to begin having those conversations about their policies, informing schools about the common application, dropping the question and wanting to know what they would do now that the question has been dropped. Um, where they use supplemental forms, ask for additional interviewing, um, and what's their stance on dropping the application. And so far, every school has said as of now, they do not plan to drop the, the question from their None application. None of those uh, colleges or universities plan to drop it? None of them. At least none of the schools that I have spoken to and had a conversation with, I plan to talk with more schools also. But none of them have, have plans to drop the question from their application. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman. I do know that this is a resolution, not an ordinance. We want to create a public record. Uh, and what we are doing, along with the Human Relations Commission, is formulating a letter uh, requesting that they consider this. And I would imagine subsequent dialogue between advocacy groups and the universities will ensue. Um, we're going to we're going to take an action step, uh, and, and you know sometimes debunking fact from fiction is a step in the right direction. Other times, um, letting people know that uh, this is a in many cases a city and regional and national asset that we depend on to produce um, educated individuals in a diverse way without discriminating and then we're gonna we're gonna push that point so seeing no more questions thank you for your testimony and we appreciate your advocacy thank you thank you Ms. Williams yes do you have the next um, witnesses to testify Mary Baxter 
Jim Baker and Sage Carson. Thank you guys for your patience. Please approach the witness table. And if you, do you have handouts there? Are those handouts? Okay, just checking. Welcome. Good afternoon. Have a seat, pull the mic to you, state your name for the record, and please begin your testimony. Sage. Yep. All right. Hello, my Hello. name is Sage Carson, and I am the manager of Know Your Nine. I am here today to represent Know Your Nine, a survivor and youth-led project of advocates for youth that works directly with survivors and empowers students to end sexual violence in schools. As survivors whose, whose experiences with sexual violence had detrimental and lasting impacts on our education, we are deeply concerned by current approaches to juvenile and criminal records that bar access to education. And as an advocate who works to ensure all students have access to education, we are particularly concerned by the, the discriminatory effects of current approaches to juvenile and criminal records on students of color. Sexual violence is an epidemic on college campuses. About one in five women and non gender nonconforming people will be assaulted while they are students. And as survivors who've experienced this violence firsthand, we are invested in the safety of students on campus. However, we also know that asking about criminal records is not a solution, particularly when the vast majority of assaults on campuses are perpetuated by people without criminal records. Furthermore, survivors, many survivors, including myself, were assaulted by privileged men without a criminal record, um, and holding folks with criminal records to different standards will do little um, to hold these privileged perpetrators of sexual violence accountable. If schools are concerned about safety and educational opportunities for survivors, they should move to survivors with fair procedural protections, provide students with access to crisis counseling, as well as provide education on consent and alcohol. Instead of keeping schools safe, the practices of asking about criminal history bars many survivors from edu education altogether. 84% of girls in juvenile detention have experienced family violence, and 90% of girls in juvenile systems self-disclose trauma. Girls, and especially black girls, are often referred to the criminal legal system from schools who have been criminalized their behavior um, and that those behaviors that are common among those that have experienced trauma, such as fighting with peers, disrupting class, and talking back. Girls are additionally criminalized for acts of survival, such as running away, truancy, and sex trafficking. Girls who have faced trauma and sexual violence should have the same rights to access to education as other survivors. As survivors who have fought and depended on Title IX, which protects students' access to education after experiencing discriminatory gender violence, we strongly support banning the box proposals that safeguard students' civil rights. Racial disparities are documented in the arrest and prosecution of every type of crime. In fact, the criminal legal system is so pervasive in the lives of black men that more black men have, been, have spent time in prison than have a college degree. Because of the overt racial disparities in the criminal legal system, policies and practices that screen for criminal backgrounds are not racially neutral. As a result, these practices violate Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. They betray the principles of the civil rights movement which sought to expand higher edu edu education opportunities for all. Denying educational opportunities to young people doesn't make our communities any safer. When education has been proven to be one of the most effective methods to reduce recidivism, Policymakers must work to dismantle legal and financial barriers um, that, that bar people from access to education. Instead of invoking survivors in defense of discriminatory policies, schools should ban the box and recognize that once an individual serves out their sentence, their punishment should end. If schools feel the need to learn about a student's criminal record in order to provide education and support to that student, that inquiry should take place after a student has been admitted to the institution. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and please uh, begin yours. State your name for the record. My name is Jim Baker, affectionately known as the other Jim Baker, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Kind of know. Uh, I'm, I'm glad 
to be here, and I thank you so much for having me. I thank you, CLS, for allowing me to give a testimony. This is my second time this year being in front of you. I was here earlier this year with uh, President Guy. We were talking about the reentry program yes. from CCP. And as always, it's an honor and a privilege. Ms. Blackwell, your husband was my hero. Thank you. I'm here. It's a bittersweet. I'm, I'm speaking on something that I'm just now beginning to live firsthand. I've been home for a little bit over three and a half years after being incarcerated, locked in a bathroom for almost two decades. I came home anxious to begin to live and to educate myself, because while I was in, I, I got incarcerated in the late 90s, and during that time, I didn't come home till 2015. During that time, they took the colleges out of the institutions where we were left to fend for ourselves, to not only re-educate ourselves, but rehabilitate ourselves and to actually find out and figure out what we wanted to be when we grew up. I'm still doing that now. And I'm happy to say that education was that thing that not only freed me, but it empowered me. While I was upstate, I had the privilege and the blessing to be educated by most of the juvenile lifers who's coming home now. They not only showed us how to live behind the walls, they showed us how to be responsible adults. So again, it's bittersweet because I'm not just home to discuss recidivism and even campaign for advocacy for rights, but I am my brother's keeper and restorative justice is my middle name. I want to convince men to be the men that they've all been called to be. So I affectionately call myself the other Jim Baker because I'm a self-proclaimed minister. I don't believe I need any education from a college book to be a minister. In fact, my faith tells me, or Paul tells me, that I am called to reconcile those that have been reconciled. So I know that this ministry that I've started now has got a purpose and a plan. And that purpose is to educate every black man, young and old, because I am an old dog that has been taught a new trick. I came home in my 50s, and after being incarcerated in my 30s, and I'm, again, not bitter, but I'm excited about showing others how to live, because I've now learned how to die to self, to live for others. So. Education has been my way of not only coping. The reentry program at CCP has showed me how to not only transition academically, but it showed me how to socially get back into good graces with family, friends, and my community. I've started again the ministry that I affectionately call uh, Mad Boys Ministries, and the acronym is mature aggression with dignity. Meaning that we're allowed to be mad, as Paul says, but we can't sin. So to be angry and sin not means that there's a whole lot of obligation on the man to not only to stand up for what he believes in, but to be that same man in the face of adversity. So I figured this thing out. Education is the key. I've been campaigning with uh, the reentry think tank, which is one of the many numerous organizations that I've been graced and pleasured to be a part of. I'm a fellow uh, servant with the reentry think tank, and this past summer we have been campaigning strong for this band of box thing. As I said, I've been home three and a half years, and in that three and a half years, I've graduated with honors from CCP. I'm, I was scheduled to start school this September at Westchester, but found out what Band of Box tastes like. I graduated with honors. They were excited about that. My essay, they said, was exemplary. Like, I knew how to put them words together. But once they saw me check that box that I was a convicted felon, they've been dragging their feet ever since. Not only that, but the three other, my three other cohorts and colleagues that were accepted also for the application process, which meant that we had to interview, 
We were all called to interview the same day, and it was an armed police officer in that room. I myself, I suffer from PTSD. From the military, I was locked in missile silos for sometimes eight days at a time. So needless to say, me being incarcerated, locked in a bathroom, kind of triggered some of that stuff. So when I came home, I found out that cognitive behavior and holistic treatments are not only good for the goose, but it's good for the gander. I've been showing men how to recapture their life and to even dream again. So education has been the key. So when we were sitting in the room and the armed guard was in there, the guy that went in before me freaked out. He couldn't take it, he had to leave, he was sweating, almost felt sick to his stomach. So our mentor who was with us told us that we was going to stop that process. And because we stopped it, we, we didn't say that we weren't going to do it. We said we wanted to postpone it so that we could prepare for it. Once they found that out, again, they've been dragging their feet and uh, doing all kinds of tricks and things just to make it harder for us to get in there. But I thank my God that I've got a little resilience with this age, a little fortitude in my pocket that uh, this isn't going to stop me. And it isn't going to stop me because I got to do this for Pookie and Ray Ray. Pookie and Ray Ray on them corners. I, and and uh, I, a little side note, I lost my mom this past February. So she wasn't able to see me walk down the aisle. But uh, it was a guy on the corner, S, who had got killed two days before me that I was convincing him that if he would just go to school, he would figure out what he wanted to be when he grew up. So he had this plan to pop a bottle of champagne with me, but I kept telling him, yo, we can't be saying that all loud, I'm on parole. So when he passed, my mother passed after it, and it made it extremely hard for me to graduate on time. But as I said, I had to do it for others and not just for myself. So once I did that, I was a little proud as a peacock, but still trying to figure out what the next step is. Although I know what I, I like to do, I know what I want to be when I grow up, I still want help to find out and figure out these things so that I don't keep bumping my head or, or doing things because I'm on parole or because it's mandated or stipulated. I'm trying to regain not only my rights, but I'm trying to regain my dignity too. And so these things like ban the box has really been a hurdle that has been really hard to climb over. And I live by this African proverb that I use with my ministry, which says that if you want to go fast, run by yourself. Mm. But if you want to go far, run with others. So I'm asking city council, my cohorts and colleagues to come run with me because I want to go far. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know Pookie, but I do know Ray Ray. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I'm uh, sorry for what you're experiencing in your next leg of your journey, uh, but have patience because, um, you know, as, as we enlighten others, you know, doors open. I like to say that this council closes jails and opens opportunities. Yes. Uh, and this is a step yes. in the right direction to do that. We, in, we intend to be um, as persistent and as uh, patient Thank as we you, have Council. to be to, to make change. Thank you. So uh, we appreciate it. Do uh, Councilwoman Blackwell and, yes. and Councilman Gibbs. I would certainly like to say that our doors are open. I'm right there in the hall. We're happy to be of assistance. We've been around here for a very long time. And it would be a pleasure to try to work with you to help you uh, go where it is you would like to go. Thank you. Thank you. Say it again. Thank you. You haven't spoken yet. OK. <laughs> he, he saved you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait a minute, Councilwoman Kim, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, very briefly. Um, I want to thank uh, this panel, especially um, folks who are closest to the pain have to be part of the solution and it's really um, you know we express a ton of gratitude for you for uh, sharing your stories 
um, Ms. Carson for being a survivor and for speaking out for uh, victims and showing solidarity too as well as deeply moving to all of us um, on council and we're just you know very grateful for all of you um, and uh, you know I think one of the things that that um, I'm interested in is whether you've seen um, any receptivity from higher education, it doesn't have to be the college or universities themselves, but folks who are involved in higher education to be part of the reentry coalition that you've built out together. Have you, have you seen interest from folks who are in and around higher education? Mm, it's hard to gauge, because when the lights are on, they nod their head to it, but uh, you have to usually go back and knock on the door again to see if they're going to follow up those things that they initiated. Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep looking for those folks, make sure that they're at the table, absolutely. Um, I think among the things that I've tried to do on city council is work really hard with uh, community legal services and others to make sure that we completely close uh, the possibilities of asking about juvenile records in terms of hiring and certainly if we're closing uh, access to juvenile records we should be opening up doors of opportunity with our um, with with opportunities for education I mean that's really what it's all about it's not just about employers it's also about our uh, the, all opportunities for education so we want to see that happen and I know the councilwoman as chair of the committee on education of course our great chair of public safety councilman uh, Curtis Jones Jr. and myself as Chair of Children and Youth are going to do everything we can to be in partnership with you to make sure that we see some advancement in this area too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to just follow up. Thank you, one, for your willingness to testify and be an advocate and be a light to others um, and, and sharing your story and taking your walk on the path that you've been doing so. Uh, in reference to, and it was at Westchester, and for, I just want to make sure I understand for the record that you, they, you have been accepted? I've been accepted was, for the next steps. I, I do have an interview and then a follow-up interview. Okay, so as part of, now is that a normal part of the application process that you would submit an application and then have an interview? I had no idea up until now. Okay. But the, the, the irony and the grace in this is that my student Financial aid is still good at community, so the classes I was going to take there are cheaper at right. community, so I'm still on that path. So right. September is the start date, knock on wood, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't come through, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep knocking on that door and, mm -hmm. and probably go to another college in the meantime. Okay. And so, um, and so your interview is coming up? That's yes. My understanding. Okay. Yes. And, um, and you're interviewing with either provost or assistant dean admissions or? It's admissions. Admissions, okay. Yes. All right. um, and so they basically acknowledge to you that your uh, academic work at Community College Philadelphia has been exemplary, great opportunities, great things, but yes. they still have this concern that they have in reference right. to you, you being a student in their university. Yes. Okay, okay. And in your application, um, package, did you have letters of recommendation, other things that were included with that, um, either from Community College Philadelphia or from other uh, individuals or organizations? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to revise it now because the Vice President of CCP wants to put some right, more stuff in Right, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Because I would think that considering start, you're- Start cashing in some of my favors now. <laughs> we must be thinking like, I was thinking that because of what you've been able to do at CCP, that I would think that either someone in the higher career that institution could send a letter of recommendation right. or even make a phone call on your behalf to sure. um, Westchester University because just like other college universities, CCP sends students to Westchester just like they send students to Temple and other universities and colleges and so they would have a perspective on the type of student, the caliber student that's going to be successful at these universities and clearly, ba clearly based on your academic record and your standing at, at Community College of Philadelphia, you've met that threshold and some. So I would hope that you know, Community College of Philadelphia will be able to make that entree on your behalf to the leadership of Westchester University, um, saying that this is the type of person that really should be in your university because he can make a uh, demonstration to other students about what life is about and how you can be a successful leader um, on campus. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you, Councilwoman, um, Councilman. Young lady, would you uh, state your name for the record and begin? Yes, good testimony. afternoon. My name is Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter. I'm a mother, um, musician, artist, criminal justice reform advocate, and higher ed champion. I am also on the board of Temple University's Hope Center for College Community and Justice, uh, as well as a Philadelphia Mural Arts Reimagining Reentry Fellow, um, featured on a massive mural at the Municipal Services Building right now. Um, I'm also a, a Right of Return Fellow, where I've been working extensively on the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act, and a uh, Reentry Think Tank Fellow. Uh, and we've worked on the, the Band of Box campaign uh, over the spring and throughout the summer. But none of this would have been possible uh, without access to higher ed. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, at Community College of Philadelphia, my criminal background, um, it wasn't scrutinized. Um, I excelled there. I was able to maintain a 3.7 GPA. Um, I'm a member of Phi Theta Kappa, Student Leadership Society as well. Um, but my hope and aspirations uh, were kind of halted when it came time to apply for four-year colleges. Um, when I got on the, on the common application and was faced with um, the question about my criminal record, um, having two felonies uh, and just being uh, made to relive a lot of the traumatizing uh, events that transpired during my incarceration and after, um, I just remember logging in and just logging out, and this went on for a couple months, and it was like the day before um, that I had to get it in, or I w the deadline was there, um, and I just pushed through. But, you know, that's me. You know, I'm resilient. You know, I've, I've been through a lot. I've been able to um, just press forward, but a lot of my peers and cohort members, they aren't. Um, we have 70% of people that fill out this application uh, that stop once they reach that question. Um, so, um, you know, I'm just here to, to share my story and, you know, I hope it's well received. And it is. Uh, what do you want to do with uh, your education? Uh, well, you, you get, you had a lot of titles. <laughs> so are you going to pick like one or two? Um, my hope is to start a multimedia program. Okay. Um, maybe open up a, cart, a culture and arts center where we engage um, at-risk youth. So I'm more on the preventative side, like before they even get in the system, because a lot of times, once you're in it, you, you never leave, so. I didn't ask you, pa uh, pastor, right? No. Reverend? <laughs> Self-proclaimed pastor. Well, that, I'll yeah, take but, yeah, my this pulpit is, is in the streets. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you wanna do with I, your education? Oh, I, I wanna give jobs. I wanna create something, yeah. I want to, I, and I'm, and and, it, and it's been good because, as you know, them streets. If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. So, I showed them how my hustle. Like, if I kept that three point A, I got a stack for it. If I kept it over two, I got two stacks for it. And and that's the thing that translates. Like I told them that I didn't figure out what my niche was until, like, my second or third year in. And so I told them that if you just stick around, you, they'll pay the bills and then you just figure out along the way. And then the, the marvelous thing about it is that the networks that I bumped into is like the reentry think tank, the carceral community, and even you know, the president of community college you know, dropping me off or dropping something off for me. They see that, and it's like tangible evidence. It's that faith, that substance of things hoped for. That evidence that they see I got that they want to. So I really just want to figure out how to just educate them. I, I, want, I want to continue going to school, not just to keep my loans in deferment, but I just want to go to school so that I can eventually get a doctor's and rewrite the textbooks. Thank you so much, guys, for your testimony. Only thing I will say is the education doesn't stop in the classroom. When you're no. in the hallways, when you're in the study halls, right. when you're in the lunchroom, right. when you're at the activities, right. you're meeting positive people that can uh, be uh, a catalyst for other opportunities. Sure. And so you surround yourself with successful people, success seems to find you quicker. So are there any other questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Williams, are you behind me? Oh, Sorry. <laughs> can you read the next 
a witness group to testify? Mark uh, Strandquist and Courtney Bowles. Thank you guys for your patience. Please have a seat and pull the mics to you. And in either order, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, city council members. Thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Courtney Bowles. I'm an artist, activist, teacher, and I have the incredible honor of being the co-director of the Reentry Think Tank, which is a program that looks to individuals in reentry as the experts that the city needs to hear from most. Over the past year, we've partnered with Community Legal Services on the campaign to ban the box from college applications. We created a petition and have had over 1,000 individuals across the city show their support. We've gone to Temple University three times where we've had productive conversations with students, teachers, neighbors, alumni, campus staff, and college graduates, all of whom have agreed with us that higher education should be accessible to everyone. I want to point out this giant stack of paper here. Uh, we brought over a thousand signatures today as evidence that your constituents agree that we should ban the box. We'd also like to acknowledge the evidence packets that you all were presented with earlier. These are filled with powerful artwork created by those in reentry, reflecting their dreams, hopes, and demands surrounding access to higher education. Of particular note is a copy of the Ban the Box poem that you all will hear in a moment. Um, it's written by fellows of the reentry think tank and printed on sheets of paper made from criminal records by women in the People's Paper Co-op Arts and Advocacy Fellowship. There are so many talented and brilliant people in Philadelphia who are struggling with barriers that reentry creates, some of whom you've heard from today and yet they still manage to thrive and help make Philly a better place. Imagine what our city could look like if we all had access to fulfilling their, our dreams of college education. Thanks so much for your time today, and I passionately encourage you to ask Philadelphia colleges and universities to ban the box. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Councilman Jones and City Council for holding this hearing. Um, my name is Mark Strandquist. Uh, I'm honored to share the room with so many amazing lawyers and advocates. I want to give just a quick shout out to all the amazing women from the People's Paper Co-op and Reentry Think Tank for holding up these beautiful signs that they made for the hearing. So thank you all for being such powerhouses. Um, so I've spent the past uh, 10 years working with incarcerated youth, adults, um, and formerly incarcerated men, women, and teens um, in Philly, in Virginia, and around the country. Um, our projects all look to folks in the system or, who, or people who've been through the system as the experts that society needs to hear from most and connect their sort of dreams, demands, stories with advocates and organizers to impact change. Our projects have closed prisons, passed laws, are training an entire police force in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and locally, uh, we've interviewed over 1,200 Philadelphians with criminal records, asking the question, if you were in power, what would you do to keep people free? So 1,200 Philadelphians were interviewed. Um, the vast majority of those people who responded talked about educational opportunities. Not because education is a silver bullet. We all know that um, employment, housing, mental health services, all of these things are part of the network of support that people need. Um, but that they understand that education allows for people to unshackle them from their past, to unlock future potentials. You know, people don't want to be stuck in a dead-end job you don't want to be sort of uh, forced into uh, you know, low-wage labor for the rest of their lives. And education is, a, is an amazing pathway um, to, to achieving the futures that all of us want for ourselves, our families, and our loved ones. Um, I'm going to shut up um, and play a video um, because this work, again, is about listening to those most affected. Um, and if you, in your packets, uh, find the poem that says Ban the Box at the top, again, that's on uh, paper made from shredded criminal records. Um, uh, we asked uh, Reentry Think Tank fellows who are advocates from all over Philly um, to create a, a piece about educational freedom um, and what it would mean for their lives. So thank you again for um, uh, listening to so many amazing advocates um, and for, for giving us space for this important conversation.
want an education? Think about it. College is supposed to be a ladder to goals and higher achievement. An open door that allows people to engage and explore. A tool to help us attain our dreams and reach our community. But we're locked out. Segregated. Kept from fulfilling our dreams. We just want the opportunity to feel it. Think about it. Higher education would free me to be a, a better me. A leader. A good example for my children. A grief and recovery counselor. An inspiration for the next generation. A better caregiver and contributor to society. A full human being. Whatever I want to be. Bang the box! Can you see me in class? Happy in the front row. Fulfilling my dreams and charting my own destiny. Becoming a successful part of society. Moving forward. Unshackled to my past. I am a lifelong learner. A teacher for my generation and the next. A future nurse. A healer of communities. A mentor. Someone who can share the support and assistance that I needed on my own journey. Higher education would make me versatile. Make me coach. It would provide me with a broadened mind and a fresh start. It would help me become not just a student, but an expert in liking, empowering, and a compassionate educator. I'm sure that I, just like many others in my situation, would bring honor, not shame, grace, not disgrace, to this institution of higher learning. But we need to help us our country. I imagine you all recognize a few faces in that video um, from some of the brilliant folks who testified today. Um, but I want to give a shout out to Jim, Mary, Umar Bey, um, Anthony, David Garvin, and many others from the Rancher Think Tank who are in the audience today who made that film possible. So thank you again for your time and please. If, take... we, if we want to put that on our respective websites and yes. Facebooks, how do we? So if you go to reentrythinktank.com, you could find it yourself, but we will do the due diligence and just email them to your staff. We have to buy it? It's With, fine? No. No, it's good. No, no, no. no Everything no. we make is for sharing for free. Okay. Please. So say to, repeat for the public, where, where do we go? You would go to reentrythinktank.com. Reentrythinktank.com. Got it. All right. But I second faiths. I second faiths. Thank you all. Some of you were in that video, too. Mm -hmm. There you go. I recognize you. OK, so uh, are there any questions for this panel? Seeing none, what I want you to know is that we're going to take this opportunity and the things that we heard today. And we're going we're to ask our education community who benefit from uh, not being taxed in the city of Philadelphia to help us to um, further the education and then economic contribution of people who go to those institutions, get jobs, and, and, and pay their way through their tax contributions. And so we're going to do that. We want to work with you uh, and offer an opportunity uh, to, to teach us more. I've seen many of you testify before, uh, and I know sometimes it seems like you're just talking and we're not listening, but believe we hear you, uh, and uh, we have, um, we, 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 we're on it, I will tell you that. And I think the, move, the needle is moving in the right direction. There are no such thing as throwaway people. Everybody deserves an opportunity for a second act, uh, and a third act if you need it. So thank you for dedicating your time uh, and, and your treasury in, in some occasions. You could be doing all kinds of other things, but you're doing this, and we appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, it took, well, matter of fact, in three weeks, right? Uh, we got it. All right, so um, without that, thank you all, and this concludes our public hearing on um, committee to uh, public safety committee. Thank you very much. Thank you.